Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. So tonight I'm going to do something a little different. Um, I spoke at our local public library this afternoon on the topic of letter writing and the history of the Postal Service. So um, for those of you who aren't aware, I run a international letter writing society called the Victorian Letter Writers Guild. I've um, had that for about four years now and um, I also, a couple of years ago, started a local letter writing society within my community. And so we have a monthly meeting, and so this month was my turn to talk. And so I posted about that on my Facebook earlier, and several friends said that they were interested in hearing about that talk too, and so I told them that I would refilm it here at home. So I am in my uh, craft room tonight. I am my, my little office library craft hangout letter writing area. Um, in my home, um, my husband has gifted me with this entire room um, to just sort of set up my pretty things. And that really uh, means a lot. It's pretty huge because we have eight children at home still and we have children that are sharing rooms um, in order to give me this space and so that's really a blessing. I really appreciate that my family is willing to give me, uh, to sacrifice for me to have this just spot to relax and um, to have the things out that I enjoy. So anyway, here I am in this room. Um, if you can hear my little, um, let's see if I can get it. Here's my, <laughs> my dad bought me that clock um, for my birthday last year. It's really special. Cuckoo clock. <laughs> so we'll see if I can get through the talk before it cuckoo. It's probably not. <laughs> it's probably going to cuckoo on us. So I put together this talk. I'm refilming it for all of you. And on top of that, I'm actually going to figure out how to add graphics, photos, pictures, whatever, images to this video. Now, don't laugh at me, but that is like really, really huge and I have no idea how to do that. So you better share the heck out of this video because I'm going to work really hard on it. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about the history of the Postal Service, stamp collecting, current mail art trends, um, and just the evolution of letter writing in our society. So this is not at all like an exhaustive study of the entire history of the postal system since the Dark Ages or anything like that, but it's just a few fun bits of information. Um, Please don't feel like you need to, you know, fact check me in the comments or whatever like that. Um, this is just information that I found online. So if you have a different perspective, yay. But this is just what I have to share. Um, at times I'm going to go back and forth between the U.S. postal system and the British postal system because they kind of evolved together and, you know, we did come from them. All right, so the act of letter writing goes back to antiquity. Uh, the letter that the biblical King David wrote to Joab in about 1000 BC ended the life of his rival for Bathsheba. Uh, Homer also describes a fatal letter in the Iliad in about 750 BC. It was a long time ago that letters were recorded as being written. Um, then letters have been written on all kinds of materials, right? Lead, metal, wood, pottery, animal skins, even on an apple, as in Ovid's story of Acontius and Sidope. And they've been written for all kinds of reasons. To start a relationship, to end a relationship, to teach, to learn. They've been sent with joy or with regret. They've been sent out of love and out of shame, but always in an effort to communicate something meaningful. In this particular slide, we see George III um, on the eve of the war with Napoleon. In fact, it's just a few days before the beginning of the Napoleonic Wars. Um, this was made in 1803, and this is a picture of a letter George III wrote. Um, he wrote it in his own hand, you know, as opposed to having a a scribe or, you know, some sort of servant, write it for him. And this letter actually sold in 2019 for $15,000 at auction. So that just goes to show how important some letters and pieces of history are. But the truth is, that's how our history has been preserved in so, so much of the time, right? With letters or journals, that is how we've been able to pass on our information and our histories through our letters. Um, so it's important that we write letters and it's important that we save letters. 
um, and maybe a journal backup. <laughs> So I've often said that I express myself better in writing, but how many times have I shot off an angry email or hastily posted something on social media only to wish I could take back my words? Our digital age makes it easy for us to communicate with keyboard and keypad letters in a matter of seconds when, in contrast, even today's fast-paced society takes several days to mail a written letter just across the street. Most of us have memories of writing letters to an older family member or a friend, before the internet took over, this was how he communicated with grandma because a long distance phone call was too expensive. Homemakers sent recipes back and forth, men conducted business by correspondence, teenagers sent love letters to celebrity crushes, and children copied the address on the back of the cereal box to request a catalog to make a birthday list. The internet completely changed all of this, and for a short time, there was a fear that the art of letter writing was forever a thing of the past. But this is not so. Now that the newness of the internet has worn off, snail mail is trending again. In fact, it's the very existence of the internet that is making letter writing great again. Several letter writing societies, mail swap groups, postal art communities are cropping up internationally, as well as locally, and people are finding the peaceful relaxation of letter writing and postal art creation to be a lovely calm in this chaotic world. As a little girl, I received a postcard or letter from my great-grandmother monthly, sometimes weekly, until she passed away in 2005. I didn't write to her nearly as much as she wrote to me, but I credit my love of letter writing to her and a few other family members who knew I loved to read and write and would send me fun correspondence. In school, I was always in trouble for passing notes to friends. I have a dresser drawer full of love notes between my husband and I during our high school years and my college years. And another with letters that are from my mom since we spent time apart during my high school years. I'm so thankful to have these records of little bits of my life to pass along to future generations. They help me remember loved ones who are gone. And they help me to see how I've changed and grown. They're all pieces of my history. After I was grown and had my own family, I didn't have a lot of time for letter writing. I had many young children at home and my faithful letter writers had either passed away or had li their lives had gotten busier too. But most of all, we'd all discovered Facebook. Why write a letter that takes days to be received when I can communicate all I need to in seconds? The problem with going totally digital, though, is that there's no record of your life to pass along. Where is the record of the last 20 years of my life? It's on a social media site somewhere. <laughs> or it can be erased in the push of a button. <laughs> we don't even push buttons anymore now. We click keys. <laughs> When I was a little girl, I dreamed of finding an old trunk in an attic. I'd spend a rainy afternoon going through all the letters and journals inside, and I'd learn all about my secret family history that had laid hidden away for decades within dusty, musty letters and diaries. How are my daughters and granddaughters going to have this experience? I guess I'll have to give them my Facebook password. Our stories are important. Right now, I don't have any grandchildren to write letters to. So I write my future grandchildren letters in my diaries. My story is important and I want them to know who I am. About 10 years ago, I discovered a site called SwapBot.com <laughs> and it opened a whole new world to me of meeting people and sharing things through the mail. I discovered things like mixed media art collage and stamp collecting and traveling postcards, craft sharing and book swapping and many, many people all over the world looking for a pen pal. About five years ago, on a trip to England, I discovered the Jane Austen Letter Writing Society, which opened the door to a few more pen pal matching sites. Then, in the summer of 2017, I founded the Victorian Letter Writers Guild. I host quarterly international personalized pen friend exchanges, and I author a website on the history and the art of letter writing in the postal system. This group has grown to over 700 active ladies worldwide. We periodically do themed group exchanges, and I also match up pairs of ladies as pen friends. It has been so fun to learn about the people and the cultures all over the world, and I often hear how group members have felt less lonely on their birthdays because of the cards that they've received in the group exchanges, or how they've found a special friend in a private pen pal match. It's been especially great for some people who have been in very restrictive lockdown situations. These things didn't occur to me when I started that group, but it's been a blessing to know that these are the results. And in the winter of 2019, I started the Northwest Arkansas Letter Writer Society. If you want more information about that, 
make sure to message me. Letter writing is not dead, but it's definitely different. The majority of people that I correspond with are people that I have never actually met in person. Some of my closest friends live thousands of miles away from me, but we hold in common our desires to slow down and express ourselves and to share our thoughts and ideas and dreams with someone who will take the time to sit down and thoughtfully read them. Letter writing and letter reading has changed because our world has changed. When I receive a letter from a pen friend, I set it aside for a quiet moment after my kids have gone to bed. When I think I can get through the whole thing uninterrupted, I set the mood for enjoying the letter by sitting near a lamp with a low light, or sometimes I even light a candle or make tea first. Sometimes I sit in this chair, it's a really cozy spot. I take the time to look at the envelope and read the address and think about how far this letter has traveled. Sometimes there are stickers or other artwork on the envelope, and I think about my pen friend taking the time to create this pretty letter for me. I think about the neat techniques that she used to decorate it and plan how many ideas I can steal. I use the letter opener to slit the top. Sometimes she's tucked in some little extras for me, a quote on cardstock or some embellishments to use in my art, stickers or a tea bag, or a little questionnaire for me to fill out and send back. I call these my pretties, a term that my great grandma used to use when she'd ask if I wanted to play with her little box of toys. When I write back to my pen friend, I thank her for including the pretties. After I take the time to actually read the quote and savor the pretties, I breathe deep and smile and open the letter. I'm not kidding, I really do these things. In this crazy, busy world, one has to purposefully do these things to remember that we're human. I remember that a human wrote this letter. Somewhere in the world, an actual person took the time to write this letter to me, and that's huge. When we think of the history of letter writing, we conjure up all kinds of images. We might start with a scantily clad caveman carving out letters on a slab of rock, and then jump to an ancient Chinese man painting mysterious characters on a sheet of bamboo. We then may fast forward to a monk or a scribe scribbling away by candlelight. And if, after that, perhaps we imagine a ship captain in his quarters, writing out a report to whomever commissioned his voyage. From then on, we usually imagine an old-fashioned letter writer as a woman in a gauzy dress sitting at a little table, staring into space with a quill pen between her fingers. But the image that we never ever imagine is a 21st century housewife sitting in front of a laptop with a stationery that she printed herself on her fancy office grade printer and a disposable fountain pen that she bought on Amazon, writing to a 20-year-old Romanian college student that she met online. As I mentioned before, letter writing goes back as far as writing itself. But my areas of expertise, if you can call it that, are much more recent. So in 1635, Charles I made his royal mail available for public use, and Oliver Cromwell established the first post office in 1657. After the Restoration, Charles II allowed the royal mail to operate the postal service, and all proceeds went to the government. In those early years, postage prices were calculated based on how far the letter traveled and how many sheets of paper comprised the letter. Letters were kept short and to the point, and it was really only the wealthy and the businessmen who benefited from the Postal Service. Everyday folks had to trust friends and passers-by to carry their letters to the intended recipients, and there was little way to know whether they were actually received. Even those who could afford it kept their sheets of paper small and used the technique of the crossed letter to save space. This is an example of a crossed letter that I got from my friend from Australia. You start out by writing your message all in one direction and filling the sheet, then turn it to the side and write again. And some people even turned it diagonally to offer a third line of correspondence to their friend before flipping the paper over and doing the entire thing all over again on the other side. This way they got the most bang for the buck and they sort of outsmarted the postal service. So envelopes would have been considered another sheet of paper, so early letters were just folded over and sealed with wax and a signet ring or a seal. In fact, I was reading Pride and Prejudice the other night and was talking about Mr. Darcy and how he had written so much that he had even written on the envelope. One also had to keep in mind that it was the recipient and not the sender who paid the price of postage. So many letters sat on post office shelves until they were eventually thrown away undelivered. Sharp contrast from now where we have to pay ahead of time. Those days, they paid when they received it. So strangely, the Postal Service would not deliver letters from one London address to another. 
so people had to employ private messengers to carry packages or letters across town. In 1680, William Dockra created the Penny Post, charging one penny for letters under a pound in weight, delivered within a 10-mile radius. This, along with his idea of prepaid postage, was revolutionary. Docker had a postmark ink stamped to each letter sent by Penny Post. A triangular shape with a sorting office initial in the middle indicated that there was no more postage to do on the letter. It was accompanied by a heart-shaped stamp with the date and the time of the dispatch, and this helped to keep the post accountable, and the recipients would know whether it was the carrier who had delayed their mail or their own servants. The idea was genius, but as was the way in those days, the Duke of York, later King James II, who owned the monopoly on postal revenue, sued Dockra and made the penny post part of the Royal Mail Service. The popularity of writing letters increased, and by 1770, the numbering of houses began. By 1805, it was mandatory to have a house number. Letter writing was fast becoming a favorite hobby, a pastime, and a part of culture and everyone needed to have their houses numbered to make mail delivery much easier. The first stamp collector was probably John Bourke, who served as Receiver General of Stamp Dues in Ireland in the late 18th century. He made a book of the revenue stamps that he'd collected up until 1774, along with the hand-stamped charge marks that went along with them. Some revenue stamps were also used as proof of postage paid. So these were not the adhesive paper stamps that we have today, but an actual dip in ink stamp. A revenue stamp was a label used to collect taxes or fees on various things like alcohol and legal drugs, firearms, playing cards, and more. We don't use these anymore as these taxes and fees are just tacked on automatically through computerized checkout and account numbers are used to track payments. In the 18th century is known as the Great Age of Letter Writing because that's when private letters really started to become talked about publicly. Mail routes were expanded, making timely delivery much easier and less expensive, and people began using their letters as ways to make themselves known. With cheaper and faster deliveries, they could write more letters, so they could convey more than just bits of necessary information, but they started talking about the weather and their health and their pastimes. Public figures used letter writing to build an image and increase their popularity. Who doesn't want to read someone else's private correspondence, right? The poet Alexander Pope carefully constructed his letters to give off a certain image of himself, and then he had them published, and many others did the same. The epistolary novel became popular, a novel that's told in the form of letters. Francis Burney and Samuel Richardson wrote successful epistolary novels. The first North American novel was in letter form, and so was Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Jane Austen played around with a technique in her short work Lady Susan, and some people even think that Pride and Prejudice was originally written as a series of letters called First Impressions. To help finance the war against Napoleon, the London penny post was increased to tuppence in 1801 and threepence in 1805, but it was the postal reforms that took place between 1837 and 1840 that made postage affordable to everyone. This is when rates began to be determined by weight and not by distance. It was found that the most money was being spent not on transporting the letters, but on handling them. If a system of uniform prepaid letter sheets and adhesive stamps were available to all, the service could be streamlined. Once it was instituted, revenue saw a 120 increase in just three months. The first postage stamp, the Penny Black, was used in 1840. It featured an image of Queen Victoria. Because it was the first postage stamp, the penny black did not show a country of origin. Today, British stamps are still the only postage stamps not to do so. All British stamps also follow the first stamps by incorporating an image of the reigning monarch. People began collecting stamps right away, and by 1860, this new hobby had spread across the world, and some countries began overproducing stamps because they knew they could sell them to collectors. Stamp albums began to appear in shops and catalogs, as well as literature about stamp collecting. Although collectors were mainly children and teenagers in the beginning, many of them grew up to continue their hobby as adults. For over 175 years, people have found stamp collecting to be an endlessly gratifying hobby. One is always receiving mail, from which to glean more stamps. So I want to show you my stamp collection book. I've been working on this for a couple of years. It's definitely not finished. But a few years ago, a friend sent me this pretty book. It's very metallic. <laughs> and so I started a stamp collection. Um, now in the front of it, I just have some rare sorts of things. Uh, 
At the beginning of this book, I have it arranged by colors, so you can kind of see how you know, I've got a red page, and purple, orange and green. And then as you go on through the book, I have it arranged um, some pages just by theme. So I've got a bird page here, and this side are stamps that are rainbows, different uh, rainbow colored pictures. Back here I've gone with things that are black, and then every stamp I have of Queen Elizabeth II. <laughs> so it's a really fun book. I still have quite a bit to fill in. Um, but I'm really enjoying it. I recently had someone send me his um, stamp collection, and that was just oh, there's the cuckoo. <laughs> that was just such a blessing um, and fun because um, many of them were really old stamps and things that I hadn't seen before. So I'm working on getting that put into my book too. This is one of those things that I can pull out when my kids are bored and making everybody crazy. I'll just be like, come look at Mama's stamp book. <laughs> so now I want to talk a little bit about the United States Postal Service specifically. Um, in the early years of our nation, the phrase was, the United States are, as opposed to, the United States is. State loyalty came before country loyalty. The organization of the U.S. postal system was started and ran similarly to the British system, but it is one of the main things that united our states together, right? The states all had to work together in order to to uh, deliver mail over state lines. In fact, the USPS was founded almost a year before we actually became the United States. With the advent of the Postal Service, citizens now had a direct line to their governments. Before the incorporation of the telegraph in the mid-1800s, mail was the only way to communicate long distance. It was really difficult for whole families to settle in the West because of the issues with isolation. If you told your mother goodbye in Missouri and moved out to Oregon, a lot of times that was the last time you would ever see your mother. But being able to correspond usually lightened the heaviness of that a little bit. Therefore, one of the first steps that a town took to legitimize itself was to apply for permission to build a post office and to have its own zip code. And we even think of that now. How do we determine if a city is a city? If it has a postal service, a post office, and a zip code. Postage was not cheap. It cost today's equivalent of $7 to send a one-ounce letter across the country in 1850. But people were willing to pay this price to communicate. Newspapers shipped for free, so the country was able to unite through knowledge, participate in national politics, and more. Transportation accommodations grew out of the postal system. The post roads that were built for mail routes have morphed into many of the roads that we use today. So when you see roads called post or stagecoach or wire, it's likely that these were once mail routes. Many of our popular airlines like United and Delta started out as air mail carriers. After World War I, there wasn't really a need for aviation until the advent of air mail. Air mail stops around the nations allowed for communities to grow their aviation programs when they never would have had a market for it if they relied solely on just passenger flight. So as I said earlier, my main area of interest is the Victorian era. More than any other time in modern history, the Victorian age saw the most change to European and American societies. Many rural farming communities transitioned to urban centers of industry. Men and women began to talk about and take steps towards redefining their traditional roles. Theories about God and the origin of man and the practice of religion began to be publicly put forth, challenged, refuted, or solidified. The Victorian age saw a great revolution in the Western world. In the mid to late 1800s, as letter writing became an extremely common and inexpensive form of communication, certain manners and etiquette sprang up around the practice. Victorians published letter writing manuals to give one an idea of how to compose a letter for any and every circumstance. Instructions were given on appropriate decoration for a letter, depending on who you were and who you were writing to. Content as well as aesthetics were important. Men were encouraged to use the plainest paper that could be found. Women, though, could add a spritz of perfume, and don't we all love it when people do that? <laughs> and all kinds of decorations, ribbons, flowers, sketches, and all the colors. Toward the end of the century, heavy, creamy paper with a monogrammed letterhead was the fashion. Simple and elegant. Sealing wax was still used and popular, but the methods of use changed over time. Wax wafers and dried gum were used by the general public for quite a while, 
But later on, colored wax became more popular, and certain colors meant certain things. For instance, red was used in letters between men or business partners, and black was used for mourning. Pink was used for congratulations. Women were free to use a range of colors no matter who they wrote to. Black ink was the favorite for letters, though some used blue as an alternative. While some letter guides cautioned against any other colors, others said they'd once been in fashion. This mentality carries on today as some would shake a finger at signing an important document with anything but black or blue ink. And this brings me to today's postal art trends. These days, letter writers decorate not only the paper their letters are written on, like the Victorians did, but we also decorate the envelope. I've made and received some pretty elaborate pieces of mail with many textured layers of artwork on the envelope. Some favorite ways to decorate paper and envelopes include acrylic paints and watercolors, colored pencils and gel pens, magazine cutouts, old book pages and sheet music, ribbon, lace, stickers, and more. You can find many examples on Pinterest and lots of YouTube tutorials on how to make your correspondence super pretty. You can find envelope templates, um, all kinds of cool ideas for letter writing and making postal art. Often people will purchase unused retired stamps off of eBay to use on their mail. Just like in times past though, postage prices depend on the weight and the thickness of what you're mailing. So you want to make sure that you are checking your postal scale, um, make sure that you're weighing your items, check for thickness issues. If you have a very heavily decorated envelope or you've included a lot of things in it, you want to make sure and weigh it um, and then check the thickness because you want to um, make sure that you have enough postage on it. If you're not sure, just take it to your post office and ask them and they will kind of walk you through what the regulations are to make sure that you don't have your letter returned to you or worse delivered to the recipient with postage due. There's nothing worse than <laughs> doing that to someone when you're trying to make something pretty for them and they end up having to pay for it. And a lot of people don't realize that if your letter is very thick it actually goes through as a package and that can cost you two or three dollars or even more just depending on how heavy it is and how thick it is. So do uh, your research on postal rates and requirements um, for a first class letter and above. Make sure and take it to your post office if you have any questions and let them walk you through it and before long you will be a pro at being able to figure it out right from home. The Postal Service is pretty forgiving about what can be mailed. Basically, if it can hold a mailing label and it's not dangerous, you can mail it. So I have received all kinds of crazy stuff in the mail with just a label on it, no packaging. So I've received a Frisbee, um, one flip-flop, a plastic dinosaur, um, a pop bottle full of like toys and candy and stuff, and she just fixes the label right to the outside of whatever it is that she's mailing and she sends it. Um, according to a Facebook meme that's rolling around out there, people actually sent their children as well through the mail. I don't know about that. I don't know about the truth of that, but um, I've considered it. So postal art is a fantastic way to practice mixed media art. It's so fun to receive a pretty decorated envelope in the mail, and I'm sure that it makes our postal carriers smile as well. Postage prices rise quite often nowadays, and it can be difficult to remember the exact price of a stamp from year to year. In 2007, the Forever stamp was introduced, and then in 2011, all first-class one-ounce stamps became Forever stamps. So basically, you buy the stamp, and it is forever good on a one-ounce first-class letter. Um, people buy them by the hundreds uh, because they want to make sure you get the best price as the stamp prices do continue to rise. Um, however, you know, some people believe that uh, government funds the Postal Service, and that is just not true. The Postal Service actually doesn't receive any taxpayer revenue at all directly, and so the way that they are funded is through the sale of their stamps and the sale of other services, you know, like your packages or all that junk mail we complain about all the time. That stuff is actually keeping the Postal Service running and operating. It's not receiving government funds, so that is one of the reasons why I feel really passionate about continuing this art of letter writing. Um, that's why I run my International Postal Society. I want to keep our postal service going. You know, even if the prices are rising so, you know, regularly, if you really think about it, for 58 cents, I can have someone drive to my home, pick up a letter that I've written to my mother who lives in Oregon, which is 1800 and some odd miles away from me. They drive it to the nearest processing facility. The facility people make sure it gets processed. I know a lot of it is by machine, but it has to have somebody managing it, right? 
We process the letter through. It then gets shipped all the way out to Oregon, whether it's by plane or by truck, it gets there eventually, and actually only in just a few days. Then they run it through a second sorting facility, mail carrier there, you know, she picks it up from whoever has sorted it out into the piles for her, puts it in her mail bag, drives her car to my mother's neighborhood, gets out and walks the neighborhood. I know this woman. She really does walk the neighborhood. She's super fit. <laughs> and drops it in my mom's mailbox where it lands on her antique sewing table that's right under her little mail slot in the, her wall of her Victorian home in Eastern Oregon. And it's 58 cents. That is amazing. That is mind blowing that that's all it costs for that service. I'm not gonna complain about the postal service and you shouldn't either. <laughs> All right, so what I really want to convey today is that even with all the fun and pretty and artsy things that can be done to make your mail look fantastic, the real heart of letter writing hasn't really changed. People are still sharing bits of their lives through pen and paper. This ancient practice, coupled with modern technology, allows us to communicate with people all over the world. We can learn so much about other cultures, exchange ideas, exchange recipes and traditions, and record our history. Many people use international pen palling to practice a new language. I think it's important that we continue this practice. Our stories are important. If you haven't already, I hope you'll consider writing to a family member or to an old friend, even if they live nearby. One local friend and I don't communicate online at all. We only communicate by letters on purpose to keep this art alive. If you're looking for a pen friend and want someone to write to, write to me. Just contact me privately and I'll give you my address. I would love to write with any women out there who are interested in keeping up a happy, positive correspondence. So that's it for tonight, friends. I hope that you were blessed by this video. Hope that you learned some things and were inspired. And let me know in the comments if there's anything else that you want me to research about the history of letter writing or postal service in the United States. Um, if you would like to see more videos on this topic, be sure to let me know. Hit like and please share this video. Like I said, I worked really hard on this one, so I want to make sure that it gets out there. Um, thanks, guys, for stopping by. Hope you're having a great day, and I'll see you soon. Okay, bye-bye.